Welcome back guys to Wounded for War. Today we are jumping into a brand new series. Uh, it's going to be interesting uh, because it's about emotionally healthy spirituality. It's not a subject that a lot of people talk about, uh, especially in the church world, but it is something that we should be talking about because a lot of people um, out there right now are dealing with uh, what they believe is spiritual maturity. Uh, however, if you lack emotionally um, the, the stability that you need, then you can't be uh, mature spiritually. And you'll see that in this series. So my goal is to help you guys to gain some practical tools to get back to a place of uh, healthy spiritually and mature uh, emotionally. So what we're going to be doing in this series is a little bit different than the past. We're actually going to go ahead and go through uh, a series that someone else put together. It's called uh, EHS, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, as you may guess. There is a, a book that goes along with it if you want to follow on a day-by-day -day basis. Some of those practical tools are in this book for your day-to-day -day use. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day-by-Day. -day. Uh, it is put out by Pete Scazzaro. You can find that. It's a, it also says a 40-day journey with the daily office. It's, uh, it's going to help you build uh, routines and practices and, and put some practical tools in your hands to be able to have a daily uh, time, quiet time with the Lord. It teaches us how to be intimate with God. So that's a daily tool that we're going to be uh, making available to you. Also, the main course that we're going through is called Spiritu uh, Emotionally Hel Healthy Spirituality. And it is also a book that you can read. There are eight lessons in there. We're going to be going through each of those eight lessons, but to pair with that, uh, because we're going to be going through the workbook, what might be helpful is that you actually buy the book itself by Pete Scazzaro, uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, updated edition. And uh, it says it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And that is what we're looking to uh, better in our lives. So grab that book online. It, neither of these and none of these resources actually are something that we benefit off of, I benefit off of. It's solely a resource that you just would be benefiting by buying from Pete Scazzaro and their ministry so that uh, we can benefit together as we go through this course. Now, the core of the material will be from the workbook that we're gonna be going through. Now, I'm gonna give you some videos that were put together by Pete Scazzaro because he originated it, it's best he formats it for you. So he has a 20 minute video that we're gonna watch, then a small study that I'm gonna go through giving you some of those practical tools. And then we're gonna close with a five minute video. That'll be the, the uh, kind of tone and tenor that we'll have throughout the next course of eight weeks. There's a second part to this module um, and it, that is called Emotionally uh, Healthy Relationships. So first you get right with the Lord, you get your, your relationship solid with the Lord, you get that intimacy uh, with the Lord, and then out of that, you can start to learn how to engage with people. So let's dive right in. I wanna share with you guys the first video, and uh, it's with Pete Scazzaro, the founder and uh, designer of this course. So enjoy the video. I want to welcome you as you begin this journey, both as individuals and as a group, into what we call the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Course, or the EHS Course. I'm just so excited you're here, and I pray that the next several weeks will enable you to walk through a door, a door into a new, very alive, very powerful, transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. I had an incredible conversion, uh, and meeting the love of God and grasping his free grace. When I was a 19-year-old student in college, I got involved with a group called Intervarsity, learned about spiritual disciplines and scripture and, and, the, and fellowship and worship, eventually ended up in seminary, spent a year in Latin America, and then I planted a church here in New York City in September 1987 called New Life Fellowship Church. Now, Queens is a very unique 
part of the world here. Two-thirds of the two and a half million people who live here were born outside the country. And so our church is, is with people from 75 different nations. And uh, so the church grew very rapidly in its early years. It was very, very exciting. exciting. Went from zero to, to, you know, to several hundred. Uh, in the first six, seven years, we planted a, a service in the afternoons in Spanish. But I grew very tired. I found out that the yoke was heavy and it was hard. It was not easy. And I was feeling like, oh my God, when is this going to end? And I realized people were changing, but they weren't changing deeply. It was like, if you look at an iceberg, one-tenth of an iceberg is above the surface, nine-tenths is below the surface. Uh, people were changing on the outside. Yes, they were spending time in Scripture. They were coming to church. Their, their lives on an external way were, were different. Uh, but deep beneath the surface, that we see when, when you, what's un, happening in a person's life when no one's looking, that was not changing deeply. And there was a disconnect between people's apparent growing in love and fire for God and their love for people. Something was deeply wrong. And why was it that there were so many people who called themselves Christians that actually were unenjoyable to be around and often were judgmental or sometimes even a bit strange? And so I, we tried everything to try to see people get changed deeply beneath the iceberg of their lives. More of scripture, more Bible study, more, more body life, getting people into small groups and community, uh, nights of worship, more prayer meetings, greater emphasis on the spirit of God and, and the prophetic and the power of God an emphasis on spiritual warfare and deliverance. And, and, but there was, for some reason, we just couldn't seem to get at some of the material deep in people's lives so that they would experience deep transformation. And then about that time, I had my own wall. And at that point, I was 17 years as a Christian. And uh, I was tired. I, I was unhappy. I was frustrated. I was overworked. I had this dream of what God was going to do here in New York City but there, were, there was some joy that was missing. And I remember the words of Jesus, what, what profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And I was stressed. I, I was hurried, exhausted. I was dying to the wrong things. And then finally in 1994, there was in one of our congregations in Spanish, there had been a, a division and a split. And I found myself furious. I, I was angry. I was cursing. I was depressed. I mean, I, I was a pastor and in my car cursing like a truck driver. And I knew something was deeply wrong at that point. And, and again, the emphasis on, on getting things done. I, I wasn't even sure I wanted to be a Christian, let alone be a pastor anymore. There were some gaps in my own spiritual formation that I realized that, that were almost killing me. And then on top of that, uh, my marriage wasn't going well. And uh, my own wife was, was feeling like a single mom. We had four young girls at that point. And on January 2nd, 1996, my wife came to me and said, you know, Pete, uh, you know, I, I quit. Your leadership stinks. You know, I lo no longer respect it. I'm going to start going to another church. Needless to say, God had my attention. And at that point, uh, you know when you think you hit rock bottom, but you're not? Uh, that's what I found out. I found out that the bottom was a lot deeper than I imagined. But on January of that 1996 day, um, I think I finally hit some, a real rock bottom. So Jerry and I went away for a week, and I went there to fix her. She went there to fix me in the church, and, but God met us. And really, at that point, uh, I, I like to call it my second conversion. And, and I realized something, that emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable, that it's not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And, and that was a revolution. And so in 1996, we began to bring into our discipleship, into our formation, something we call emotional health. And it began to dramatically change people's lives. And I realized as, as that went on, that people were still too busy, too active to actually cultivate a, a healthy relationship with God and, and themselves. And so I began to research things like silence and solitude and the contemplative tradition and waiting on God. And, and it culminated in 2003 when I, I took a four-month sabbatical uh, to, to what I called investigate uh, the monastic tradition, investigate places where they were focusing on silence and offices and and solitude. And we took this four months to kind of live in new rhythms. And I like to call that my third conversion. Uh, by contemplative, I'm referring to slowing down to be with God. And again, our tradition as evangelicals is, is a rich one. We're, we're very active. We lead people to Christ. We get people in scripture. But we're not very good at rest and time for reflection. We're not very good at things like silence and solitude and stillness. And it colors the way we build community. It impacts the way we do our leadership. It impacts the way we interact with other people. And we end up speaking of things that we don't live ourselves. And so this has all led to a journey. And we call that journey today emotionally healthy spirituality. 
And for me, the last 18, 19 years have been the best years of my life. Personally, maritally, as a follower of Christ, the best years as a husband, as a father. I've loved being a pastor of a church. And so this EHS course that you're now in is the fruit of these 18 years. And so the material that we'll get, where we will be covering in these sessions is actually meant to challenge you. In fact, my hope is that the concepts we're going to talk about will rock your world, in a good way, of course, in terms of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. And so we will be looking at some significant missing elements of our spiritual formation and our discipleship. Things like, one, knowing yourself that you may know God, going back to go forward, journeying through the wall, enlarging your soul through grief and loss, discovering the rhythms of the daily office and Sabbath, growing into an emotionally mature adult, and going the next step to develop a rule of life. You will be invited to look inside yourself in ways you never dreamed. You will be invited to ponder honestly the genuineness and depth of your relationship with Jesus. And you will be invited to take a few practical steps that will help you follow him. The main idea that we will be unpacking here is simple, yet it's far-reaching. And that is emotional health, which is defined as our ability to be self-aware and love well, and contemplative spirituality that is slowing down to cultivate our relationship with Jesus. When these two things are brought together, they offer nothing short of a spiritual revolution in our lives. Now, a person can grow emotionally healthy without Christ. I can think of a number of non-Christian people who are more loving, balanced, and civil than many church members are known. They go to 12-step groups, they've done counseling, and they're reflective but they don't necessarily have a deep walk with Christ. At the same time, a person can be really into prayer and scripture and other Christian disciplines and yet be emotionally immature and socially maladjusted. They're unaware, defensive, judgmental, and touchy. But it's these two things together, emotional health and contemplative spirituality, that release great power to transform our spiritual lives to transform our families, our workplaces, our churches, and ultimately the world around us. And it's King David, the one who's described as a man after God's own heart, who models for us what we call emotionally healthy spirituality. He's emotionally aware. Uh, that is, he's very aware of what's going on inside of him. He, we see him in the Psalms. He's outraged, he's suicidal, he's depressed, he's overjoyed, he's dancing, the whole gamut of emotions. And we observe him uh, really broken and, and vulnerable before God and other people. He's not pretending at all. Who else would commit adultery and murder and put it in a song to be sung in church? That's Psalm 51. At the same time, David has a deep passion for God. He pants for God like a deer pants for water. He writes songs about God. He worships. He seeks God's face. He loves scripture. He's a man after God's heart. Now, this material may be difficult for you at times. So remember, once we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, our standing before God is based on Jesus' righteousness, not our own. It's based on his perfect record, not our imperfect one. It's based on his performance, not our own. So we live and we swim and move in his love and his grace alone. So don't be afraid. We simply want you to be real. We want to take off our masks of pretending and let Jesus lovingly strip us of all the false layers that don't belong to him. My prayer in this course is that this might be a safe place for you in these coming weeks as you go beyond tip of the iceberg spirituality into what's going on deep beneath the surface in your life. Our goal is not to fix people or change people. And actually, we can't even fix or change ourselves. That's God's work. What we do is we open up a space so that God can have access to us and interact with biblical truth in a fresh way and to open ourselves up to him so he can do his work. So we want to give one another lots of grace and encouragement to take these next steps in the unique journey God has planned for us. So now in this first study, we will be looking at the problem of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. It will begin to unpack the principle that the degree to which we are willing to give Jesus access to what is deeply beneath the surface in our lives is the degree to which we will experience freedom in him. Let me just say that again. The degree to which we are willing to give Jesus access to what is deeply beneath the surface in our lives is a degree to which we will experience freedom in him. We'll begin by looking at the top 10 symptoms to determine if someone is suffering from a bad case of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. So here's the 10 symptoms. Number one, it's using God to run from God. There are few viruses that are more deadly 
and more difficult to discern than this one. In my case, using God to run from God is when I create a great deal of activity for God and I ignore difficult areas in my life that God wants to change. So it might be things like, you know, I use God to run from God when I, when I do God's work really to satisfy me. It's not really about him. Or I use God to run from God when I do things in his name that he never asked me to do. I use God to run from God when, when my prayers are really about God doing my will. It's like he's my secretary and not my surrendering to his. The second symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality is ignoring the emotions of anger, sadness, and fear. Uh, most Christians believe that anger, sadness, and fear are sins to be avoided, that something is wrong with our spiritual lives if we're feeling them. And like most Christians, I, I was taught that, that feelings were unreliable and not to be trusted. This applies especially to the difficult feelings of fear and sadness and anger and hurt and pain. The problem with this is it's not biblical, and the practical implications of, of such a view is enormous. We end up as a half human being suppressing our God-given humanity as men and women made in his image. And we end up missing the many, many ways God's actually speaking to us and coming to us. The third symptom is dying to the wrong things. It's true, Jesus did say, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. The question, however, is what does that mean? Yes, we're to die to the sinful parts of who we are, such as defensiveness and detachment from others and arrogance and stubbornness and judgmentalness and hypocrisy, as well as the more obvious sins described for us in Scripture. But we're not called by God to die to the good parts of who we are. God never asked us to die to the healthy desires and pleasures of life, to friendships, to joy, to art, to music, to beauty, to recreation, to laughter, to nature. God plants desires in our hearts so we will nurture and water them. And these desires and passions are, are so very often invitations and gifts from him. Fourthly is denying the past's impact on the present. When we come to faith in Christ, whether as a child, a teenager, or an adult, uh, we are, as the Bible calls, we're born again. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul says, you know, the old is gone, the new has come. That, that's our new status in Christ. And yet the work of maturing in Christ, of growing uh, what theologians call sanctification, that, that actually demands that we go back in order to break free from unhealthy and destructive patterns that prevent us from going forward to all that God has for us. So, so the goal is to go forward, but we've got to get rid of the baggage we carry first. The fifth symptom is dividing our lives into sacred and secular compartments. It's so easy to compartmentalize God to Christian activities like church or praying or reading the Bible or going to a small group. But it's easy not to think about God when we're at work or studying or when we're dealing with money or taking exams or playing sports. And in fact, according to many polls and sociologists, one of the greatest scandals of our day is that many Christians are as likely to embrace lifestyles every bit as materialistic and self-centered and hedonistic and sexually immoral as the world in general. And Ron Sider has summarized it very well. He says, whether the issue is marriage or sexuality or money or care for the poor, evangelicals are living scandalously unbiblical lives. And the data suggests that in many, many crucial areas. Really, Christians are not living any differently from their unbelieving neighbors. The sixth symptom is doing for God instead of being with God. That is, being productive and getting things done are, are the highest priorities in our Western culture. And so within minutes of being introduced to someone, we ask, what do you do? Our identity is in our doing. The problem is that our identity as Christians is in God's love for us, not our doing. It's in our being with him. Our activity for God can only properly flow from a life with God. We cannot give what we do not possess. And when our doing and our work for God is not nourished by a deep interior life with him, we end up off center. Our sense of worth and validation ends up shifting from God's unconditional love to us to our work and performance. And what happens is the joy of Christ gradually just disappears and we become human doing machines, not human beings. The seventh symptom is spiritualizing away conflict. Nobody likes conflict, yet conflict is everywhere from law courts to workplaces to classrooms to neighborhoods to marriages to friendships. We smooth over them. We, we sweep them under the rug. We pray they go away. And yet Jesus was in regular conflict with the religious leaders, the crowds, the disciples, even his own family. And out of a desire to bring true peace, Jesus disrupted false peace all around him. He refused to spiritualize it away. Instead, he actually engaged conflict in a way that brought life and brought his kingdom. The eighth symptom is covering over brokenness, weakness, and failure. It's also a symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. The pressure to present an image of ourselves as strong, 
and spiritually together, it hovers over most of us. We feel guilty for not measuring up, for not making the grade. And yet the Bible does not spin the flaws and weaknesses of its heroes. Abraham lied. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Peter rebuked God. Noah got drunk. Jonah was a racist. Jacob lied. John Mark deserted Paul. Elijah burnt out. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Thomas doubted. And all these people send the same message, that every human being on earth, regardless of their gifts, their strengths, is weak, vulnerable, and dependent on God and other people. The ninth symptom is living without limits. A core spiritual issue here relates to our limits and our humanity. We're not God. We can't serve everyone in need. We're human beings. And when we cross over limits given to us by God, we end up in trouble. Just look at Adam and Eve once they cross the limit set by God in the Garden of Eden. Jesus modeled limits for us as a human being, fully God yet fully human. He did not heal every person who was sick in Palestine. He did not raise every dead person. He did not feed all the hungry beggars. A life without limits forgets something, that God is God and that we are not. And then finally, the tenth symptom is judging other people's spiritual journey. I was taught it was my responsibility to correct people in error or in sin and to always counsel people who are mixed up spiritually or weren't in a place with God that I thought they should be in. I felt guilty. I saw something questionable. I did nothing to point it out. If I, if, I, I felt guilty if I did nothing to point it out. And most of us have no trouble at all dispensing advice or pointing out wrongdoing. But like Jesus said, unless I first take the log out of my own eye, knowing that I have a huge blind spot or many blind spots, I'm dangerous. I must see the extensive damage sins done to every part of who I am, emotionally, intellectually, will, spirit, my body, before I can actually attempt to remove the speck from my brother's eye. So in this session, you will look at Saul in 1 Samuel 15. He's probably one of the greatest examples in scripture of someone who is both emotionally unhealthy and who lacks a contemplative life with God. He's not reflective. He's unaware of his fears and his need for approval, his insecurities, his, his, his stubbornness, his tendency towards self-deception. Unlike David in the Psalms, he makes little connection between his inner world emotionally and his spirituality. Unlike David, we never see him passionately nurturing or developing his personal relationship with God. He's sloppy on both counts, and, and over time, it destroys himself, and he destroys his relationship with God and other people. I have lived the destructive effects of an emotionally unhealthy spirituality. But there is another way. So let me invite you now in your workbook as you launch into the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course, as I pray this will enable you to walk through a door in your relationship with God that will change you and everybody around you forever. So, I don't know about you guys, man, but as Pete was talking and giving those 10 uh, symptoms um, that identify if you're emotionally healthy, spiritually, or, or not. Uh, I know that for myself, at all phases in my life, I've had a struggle in one area or another. And in almost every one of these 10 symptoms that show you how unhealthy you are spiritually, I've experienced myself along the way. And so I just want to um, go through the study that he wants us to, to walk through about uh, first Samuel chapter 15 and, and Saul and David and, and I mean Saul and, and Samuel and, and I want to take a look at um, as as we look through this Saul and, and his the areas where he is uh, has some blind spots and maybe immature in some areas and and see how we might relate to him in that area so what we're gonna find in this story in brief is basically we're gonna we're gonna be introduced to Saul the king uh, uh, first king of Israel uh, and then Samuel who is God's prophet who is to bring the word of God to Saul uh, and and then we're gonna see that Saul was instructed earlier in chapter 3 where he was told to completely 100% annihilate the Amalekites um, and totally destroy them uh, they were, by the way, it's noteworthy that the Amalekites were a very, very wicked and sinful culture known for their destructiveness. So um, these people were a people that were going to corrupt and destroy everything else around them. So God had ordered uh, Saul, wipe out everything 100%. And, uh, and what we're going to see uh, is, 
is how Saul gives in to the wishes of his, his fighting men, his warriors. He's going to give in to them and it's going to cause him some trouble. So let's dive in and let's check it out. First Samuel chapter 15, starting in verse 7, and we're going to go through to 24. So I'll read and then we'll just dive into a couple questions about it. Then we'll talk about some applications in life and how we can better um, walk through life and, and victory in these areas. All right. So starting in verse seven, it says, then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur near the Eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites alive and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. Now notice right off the bat, God had given him an instruction, kill everything, destroy everything. What did he say? He took the king alive. That's going to come back to haunt him. It says, but Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle and the fat, uh, calves and lambs, and everything that was good. Does that sound like he destroyed everything? Absolutely not. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Convenient, right? Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. He's the prophet. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel, the prophet, was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul was gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and he turned at end then he has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. No, you haven't, you little turd. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of the cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribe of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people. The Amalekites wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the sight of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. Then I brought back Agag, the king. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, but the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than to sacrifice, and to listen is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men and so I gave in to them. <clears throat> so that's our story there of, of a king who was anointed, who was a nothing prior to being a king. God raises him up, takes him and places him in a place uh, where he has authority, he has influence, and, and unfortunately, some of the weakness of his character leads him into a place where he's unusable. Maybe we find ourselves there sometimes. You know, in verse 11, I want to note that, uh, do you notice what God says to Samuel in response to uh, the, actually, what, what God and Samuel say in response to Saul's 
failure to fully obey. In verse 11, it says that God regretted that he had made him king and that Samuel was angry and he cried out to God all, all night. So once, if you didn't obey the Lord, follow his commands, the Lord was angry and the people that were accountable to him, um, well, he was, he regretted it. And the people he was accountable to were, were too were angry. How does this differ though, from the response, um, that, that Saul gives us in 12 and 13, we noticed that, that he's like, Hey, bless you, Lord, uh, or bless you, bless you, brother, uh, in the name of the Lord. You know, the reality is this guy, he's clueless. He's absolutely close. The Saul thinks he didn't do anything wrong at all. He thinks he obeyed until someone points it out. He has a blind spot in other words. Maybe you've been there before. I know I have. I have a blind spot. I think I'm completely in the right. I think I'm obeying God, but somehow someone points out to me through the word of God or by the Holy Spirit, uh, just as a brother that cares that I'm not doing what God's will is. And then my eyes are open and, and I'm aware, but you were blind before. And that's what he's in. He's in that state. He thinks he did nothing wrong. You know, if, if we reread verses 12 and 24, we'll see that what might've been going on beneath the surface of Saul's life. You know, that iceberg that Pete was talking about, right? There's that iceberg, there's 10% above, and that's what people see in our life. And then there's that 90% that's underneath, and, and which makes us up. But there's a lot of flaw in that character, right? And if we, if we look at those and we see what is that um, thing that was beneath the surface in Saul's life? What was he unaware of? What was that iceberg? Well, in the end, we saw that he feared man more than he feared God. He feared man more than he feared God. God had given him an instruction. Instead, he bent to the will of the men. Well, the men, you know, they really wanted the plunder. And, you know, what he's really doing is, is step number seven of, of what Pete gave us, uh, the, the seventh thing, which was he ended up spiritualizing away conflict. That's what he did. Well, I was, I was going to sacrifice it to God, but God didn't ask for a sacrifice, did he? He said, hey, obedience means wipe them out. Get rid of them. Agag, the cattle, all the goods, wipe it out. But you see, because he feared man, he ended up spiritualizing away his sin. In verses 22 and 23, I, I would love for you to read those, reread them, and then describe in your own words how... Saul explains, um, or Samuel explains Saul's disobedience. How would you describe it? I know this is for me. When, when I see that he's frustrated, he's saying that he acted rebellious and arrogantly. He said, hey, rebellion's like, you know, divination or, or, or witchcraft. And, and, and then, dude, you're, you're arrogant. He, both of those are what he's doing or, or what describes his disobedience. List one or two examples of how you go through the motions of making a burnt offering or a sacrifice to the Lord rather than obeying him or his word. Acting or speaking from fear of what others think or being a person at church, one person at church and then another person at work or home. Maybe, uh, or not having a place in your life to be still and listen to the Lord. You know, I was thinking about it. And for me, uh, there are areas in your life where you're doing well in seasons and areas where you're not doing well in seasons. And in particular, I think I've grown a lot in this because I couldn't come up with anything. But my wife, I, I asked her because she'll always, your wife will always tell you where you're failing. Guaranteed if you ask, no problem. My wife actually said um, she couldn't come up with one for me on this. Um, however, I'll give you one of my older ones. The things that I used to struggle with a lot was there's the story of the prodigal son, right? And you have um, the older son and the younger son. The younger son is the prodigal son that goes away 
and spoils all the inheritance that he had from his dad you know, on prostitutes, partying, and having a good time. Now, I've been that guy prior to Christ. But then my problem when I came back to Christ was this, is that I became more like the older brother. I became the spiritual, judgmental, pain in the rear uh, that thought, uh, I did all this, Lord, I sacrificed this, I gave up that, I, I gave up drugs and alcohol and drinking and, and all these things and, and screwing around with women and, and Lord, I did all this stuff. And you kind of look at other people and you're judgmental, Lord. You look at other people and you're like, why are they being blessed when, Lord, I've been so obedient? That's an area where I have definitely um, fell into that category of, of making burnt offerings or sacrifices to the Lord. Lord, look at my burnt offerings. Look at my sacrifices. Look what I'm doing for you, Lord. And I think that that somehow um, comes out in a way that brought me favor. And it wasn't. It was a flaw, not a favor from God. Now, what positive steps? could Saul have taken to become aware of his own iceberg and hear God in his situation? And what might be a positive step for you and I? Well, I know that Saul is a king. One, kings aren't very humble by nature. Everyone around them uh, serves them. So one of the things he could have done is slow down and remember that God is God and he is not. You see, one of the things that we all forget is that we live in a world where we think the world revolves around us. And the truth is, uh, we're here to serve the Lord. We're here to grow and to serve other people. So he could have slowed down. What's an area that I need to do? I need to spend more quiet time with the Lord. Now, I say that, and maybe you feel the same way. I spend an hour a day in the morning, usually, trying to seek the Lord in prayer and in his word. And you might go, dude, I'm nowhere near that. I can't even, one 10 minute session a week is, is a lot for me. Everybody's at their different levels, right? Um, what I would say is this, is that you gotta start somewhere and you gotta keep growing. And where I'm at in my season, God is stretching me. He wants more of my attention, more of my time, more of my heart. And so that's somewhere where I need to grow. I need to spend more quiet time and not Prayer time where I'm talking to him, but quiet time where I'm asking, speak to me, Lord. And then I shut my mouth and listen. Now, those are the, some of the, the things to identify. What's our weaknesses? What's our proclivities? How are we a lot like Saul, right? But now we're going to see, not only was Saul unaware of what was going on inside of him, he also did not cultivate a, cult, a contemplative life, that quiet life within that, that intimacy, as I was taught by my pastor, Britt Merrick, uh, is that, hey, intimacy is what we minister out of. You spend intimate time with the Lord, you're going to be effective in ministry. You're going to be effective in life. In other words, his doing for God did not flow from his being with God. And that's how we ought to be. We ought to, our being with God will allow us to flow uh, love and care and affection for others and, and, and serving for others. Out of our being, we'll be doing. In the same way, our doing must flow from the same place, from our being with Him. Far too often, we live vicariously off of other people's spirituality and relate to God while busily on the run. Now, I don't know about you guys, but life is busy. Even in COVID, it seems like things have changed, but they're still busy. So what are the challenges that are keeping you from slowing down in your life with God? What is it that keeps you from having a quiet time, intimacy with the Lord? We have the same amount of time every single day. We have time for Netflix. We have time for... Um, eating our, our three square meals. We have time for our friendships and our fellowship with, with you know, uh, our, our pets and whatnot. We have time to go work out. We have time to go on walks. We have time to do a lot of things, but here's the thing. All those are, are doing. And if you haven't done the first step and that's being with God, all that doing is for not really. 
It's for nothing. Why? Because it's not being effective for the very purpose you were created for. So what challenges are slowing you down? Are keeping you from slowing down and being with God? You know, there's a diagram that they wrote down here in this book, and it's basically, it's two circles, right? You have a tiny little circle and a very large circle. The tiny circle is um, representative of, of your compl compl uh, contemplative life, your, your being with God. And then there's this big one, right? And it's activity for God. And, and what they want us to do is to learn how do we draw our own circles and diagrams to illustrate our activities of doing or being with God. And how do we balance those out? What do we need to do? What steps do we need to take to move closer to balancing the doing and being? The remaining sessions in the EHS spirituality course will address ways you can make changes in our lives. At this point, uh, what might be one or two simple steps uh, will take you towards the beginning of slowing down in your life and balancing those two circles. I, I want nothing more for you guys to come back in, in the next few weeks and to grasp the tools. What we did today was just uncover uh, the problem, really, and to explain that there's a problem uh, and then offer some solutions, some practical solutions. I would really invite you to look up Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Look, go get yourself the workbook, the, uh, the, the main study book, and then the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality day by day so that you can walk with us through this journey and grow in those very areas of spiritual maturity. I thank you guys for being with us. This is different. This is new. But. The goal is to make disciples that love Jesus, follow him, and surrender their lives to him. Let me pray for you guys, and then we're going to go about our day, but I invite you back next week for the second session to dive in with us and become healthy yourself. Father, we know this has been a season where many people have gone through a lot, and our emotional health is very very on the rocks, very shaky. And Lord, what we'd like to do is set it on the rock, the one that's unmovable, the foundation, Jesus Christ, that Lord, you said that if we set our, our hope, our life, our very being on him as a foundation, Lord, that we would never be shaken, that we would never fail. God, I pray for a revival in the Pacific Northwest. And the funny thing is, is as I've been praying for that, you keep telling me, Lord, that they need to be aware of the emotional health where they're at and to give them practical tools. So, Lord, I'm just trying to be obedient, trying to do what you've told me to do. It doesn't always make sense to me, but I hope that, Lord, it blesses you and it blesses others. So Lord, use this. Help me to get it out of the way and use this for your kingdom purposes, to grow others, to help them to love people the way you love people, to help them to see people the way you see them. And Lord, to heal the damage and the hurts, and the pains, and the hangouts that we've all had from our past. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys next week. Love you guys.